Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Crazy Money. This is your host, Paul Ollinger, coming to you live on tape, on reel to reel, on floppy disk from the Crazy Money Global Headquarters here in Atlanta, Georgia. That's right. Atlanta, Georgia is the home to headquarters for global corporations like UPS, Equifax, Coca Cola, and now, of course, Crazy Money. I should get some tax subsidies for having my headquarters here, don't you think? I think that would be good. Call my state legislator. Not sure who that person is, but I need to file a complaint. Hey, I've got a great guest for you today. Since it's election week in America, there's going to be a lot going on. I thought I'd bring back one of the best guests I had in 2019 and really in the history of Crazy Money for this week's episode. His name is Brad Klontz, and he is a financial therapist who works with high net worth individuals, even some billionaires, and he helps those billionaires and high net worth individuals and their families kind of figure out what their values are and how they can use their resources to live a better life. And how do they deal with some of the problems that money brings along or some of the problems they had absent their financial blessings. So Brad's a really interesting guy. He's got his own money journey that he'll share with us. We talk about a lot of really interesting stuff. I'll tell you more about him in a minute. Before I do, I want to say hello, listeners, old and new. Uh, I know I've got some new listeners out there this week. Some of you might've heard me on the earn and invest podcast with doc G so thanks, Doc G, for having me on. One of those guys reached out, John Stodge. I think I'm saying your name right, but thanks for the note. Welcome. Here at Crazy Money, we explore the connection between money and happiness and learn from our guests' expertise and or money journeys about how each of us can do money better. And we can. So it is election week in America, and I don't know about you, but I've found myself just simply exhausted, simply spent on all the political conversation. And I consider myself to be pretty much of a centrist. I want what's good for America. And when I say that, I mean, we need a strong economy, but we also need to make sure that the poorest among us have good schools and good hospitals that won't drive them to bankruptcy if they break their arm or, you know, whatever. So I want a strong, balanced America. And whatever happens this week, I want to ask you all to do so. I challenge you to do something. I want you to reach out to somebody who you disagree with politically and have a conversation with them that is not based on politics. I want you to reach out to somebody that you disagree with and find something that you both care about to talk about so that you remember what your relationship was based on, right? Because if all of you were like me, if some of you were like me, if you're a little bit like me, you've got those relationships that have soured because of political chat on social media or on email groups or whatever. Yes, I'm talking to you college friends whose email group I'm a part of. It's just like, let's just all relax. Let's take a deep breath. Let's remember what we have in common and try to love each other during this contentious time. That's my huge social commentary. Are any of you crying? Are you crying yet? I feel like You know, God bless America should be playing in the background while we all sort of stand up and say the Pledge of Allegiance and think about the Liberty Bell. I don't know. Anyway, let's talk about Brad Klons, shall we? Like I said, this conversation originally aired in August of 2019, but I bring it back to, you know, I'm doing like 46 episodes this year. So we're only taking a few weeks off. And as I mentioned in last week's introduction, new listeners have said, hey, why don't you have so-and-so on? It's like, well, I did have so-and-so on. You just haven't seen it because you haven't gone back to the archives. So I'm going to be a little bit proactive about bringing some of the best ones back, especially during the holidays as the Ollinger family will be traveling. And so we'll put some of the best from 2019 and 2020 out for you to rediscover. This guy is Brad Klontz, and he is dead in the crosshairs of what crazy money is all about. He's, as I said earlier, a financial therapist who works with high net worth individuals and helps them deal with either the problems that making money cause or the problems that making money don't solve. Believe it or not, there are many of them, and we go into depth. Brad has a concept called money scripts, and these are the ways we think about and behave toward money based on what we learned as children. And in this episode, both I and my editor slash producer, Mike Carano, and I go over our respective money scripts with Brad, and he walks us through sort of where our fears and or anxieties might come from and how they manifest in our spending and or saving today. We talk about whether billionaires can have problems, spoiler alert, they can, and why so many athletes and lottery winners go broke. I really admire Brad's work, and I know you'll find him to be very interesting because, you know, a lot of these things that he talks about are counterintuitive and 
they're good to keep in mind because money won't fix you. Here, let me tell you a little bit more about Brad. Dr. Brad Klontz is a psychologist and certified financial planner. He helps his clients understand how what they learned about money as kids affects their attitudes and dysfunctions today. Brad's work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, Time, Kiplinger's Money, NPR, and many other media outlets and professional magazines and journals. He is the author of several books, including Mind Over Money. There are links to his money disorder assessment in the show notes. So by all means, click on that and take the survey yourself and see what your money script is. You also may want to check out Brad's YouTube channel and his burgeoning channel on TikTok, This, my friends, is Dr. Brad Klontz. All right, Dr. Brad Klontz, welcome to Crazy Money. Thanks for having me, Paul. Excited to talk with you. Brad, what is a financial psychologist? Tough question. I can talk a little bit about what I am. So I'm a clinical psychologist, and then I later went back and became a certified financial planner. So I've sort of blended the two fields. So I have a few different things that I do. One is that I'm an associate professor at Creighton University, where I teach financial advisors, coaches, therapists on financial psychology, behavioral finance. I conduct research in the area. And one of my um, things that I'm most interested in is the psychology of wealth compared to the psychology of middle class. Uh, You know, are there psychological differences? If so, what can I do to help clients I work with to sort of rise that socioeconomic ladder, which by the way, a lot of people are interested in doing. (laughs) And also, uh, how can I take psychological concepts and help people change their behavior so that they can are more likely to reach their financial goals. And then I also am an owner of a registered investment advisory company where I work as a financial advisor with high net worth clients. Now, when you were in high school, did you dream of being a financial psychologist or how did you find your way to this very interesting and seemingly niche profession? Yeah. So th- this wasn't a profession when I was in school. I mean, it wasn't an option. I knew that I wanted to be a psychologist pretty early on. So that was just sort of my goal was to become a psychologist. Um, it's funny, I was actually wanted to be a mental health worker. And then when I was doing research on which one of those fields got paid the most, I sort of picked <laughs> clinical psychology <laughs> for that reason. Um, I figured if I'm going to be doing the same work, it'd, it'd be great to make more money doing it. And I sort of, I got accidentally involved in the area of finance. It was something I was always interested in based on growing up. Um, my mother, it's so funny, I had a conversation with her. I said, Mom, where would you put us on the socioeconomic ladder? when I was growing up. And she said, well, we were um, middle class except lower, (laughs) which I thought was a great way. You know, I I was like, mom, they have other words for what that is. But she didn't want to say those words. Um, So at a young age, I realized that it it seemed to be better to have money. Like you could do more things, you had more opportunities. And so at at a very early age, I was already interested in how my family ended up not having much money. And, you know, hanging out with my friends and seeing their parents. I was very curious at a young age, like, what are they doing differently than my family? Because I definitely would like to have more money given what it could provide. So that was part of my psychology growing up. And then when I got out of graduate school, I owed $100,000 in student loan debt. Mm. And I've been there. My parent, yeah, well, and my parents raised me, you know, the, we didn't have much money, but they were extremely frugal. And one of the things they put into my head was like, never borrow money for anything. Right. Well, the only way I could get my doctorate was to borrow money. And so I was pretty anxious about it, to be honest. The first year I got out of school, I think I paid about $8,000 in interest on those loans. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, this is a terrible emotional experience. And so that year, I saw a friend of mine make $100,000 trading stocks. Right. And the interesting thing about that friend is he knew nothing about the stock market, which is exactly how much I knew. And (laughs) so I was like, I can do this. This was 2000, I think you said? Yes. Yep. So I had, so I sold my truck. I basically cobbled together every penny I could get, put it in the stock market, had a great two or three months, and then the tech bubble burst. Uh And I'm watching my money sort of like decline, and I'm having all these terrible emotional experiences like, oh my God, what did I do? I'm so dumb. And I did what, you know, I mean, thankfully, I guess I was a psychologist in the sense that. I knew that when I ran into problem behaviors like this, it's like my fault. So first of all, that's a really healthy belief is that, you know, this is entirely my fault. Right. right. Um, and so I started to look into like, well, li- literally what I did, Paul, is I, I did a lit search and I'm like, okay, I'm going to find what psychologists say about money. And so I can just read a few articles, get myself set, move on in my career. And I, I started to do lit searches and I realized that there had been nothing written. There was like no studies done. 
psychology had totally ignored the topic of money, which is a big irony given that money is the biggest source of stress in the lives out of three out of four Americans. And I mean, Mm -hmm. when when you're stressed out, who do you go see? You go see a psychologist. But psychologists don't want to talk about money. Totally avoided the topic. So I sort of joke that within a matter of a month or two, I became the world's leading expert in financial psychology by default because I was seemed to be (laughs) the only psychologist interested in money. But that's what really set me on the path. Well, that's great that you found a place that didn't have as much supply as the demand that is out there. It's funny you say you you felt that the crash in the stock market was your fault. At least it was your fault that you made the investment because I was working in the technology business earlier in my career. And in 2001, when everything fell apart, I literally felt like somehow I was to blame for the economy falling apart. Like if I had worked harder, I could have sold more advertising to technology clients to help support our internet company. And one of the reasons I was because I didn't sell any of our stock before the stock crashed to pay off my student loans. And I think that was one of those financial events early in my life that affected the way I responded on the other side of things a few years later, selling stock really early because I was afraid of missing out on the opportunity to pay down debt. Yeah, and so I actually think it's really healthy for me to overblame myself, which I which I have a tendency to do. But yeah. like here's where I say it's my fault. I knew nothing about the stock market, Paul, and I put all my money in the stock market. Right. So that's fault number 1. Number 2, I put it in a highly concentrated class of only tech stocks. So I mean just a series of mistakes that I made that like clearly as a financial advisor now it's like a, it's a ridiculous thing to do. The question for me was why would a reasonably intelligent person do such radically stupid things. And as a psychologist, I realized, well, the the answer very clearly is it's my mother's fault. <laughs> sure. Mama. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, psychologists, we like to blame mothers. But I actually went home and I interviewed my mother um, because I'm like, okay, so I have some wiring around money here that clearly didn't work out so well. So I started to ask her questions about what it was like for her growing up with money. Why did grandpa, grandma and grandpa teach her around money? And all these stories started to emerge that were shocking to me. I had no idea this was going on in my family system for, for generations. And then it really put my behavior in context that made sense. So on the one hand, I was blaming myself. On the other hand, you know, I, I am just the product of generations of thinking around money, which actually helped me realize that you know these beliefs were passed down. I can do something about these beliefs. Now, as your work, your clients, many of your clients are ultra high net worth individuals and families, including billionaires. What kind of problems could billionaires possibly have, Brad? Right. Um, Yeah. So (laughs) once you hit a certain um, socioeconomic level, you cease to be human. Yes. And you no longer struggle with existential questions in life, like meaning, purpose, you know, worrying about your children. You know, all the problems are utterly erased if you get enough money. It's a really interesting issue. So really what I work with people around is the fact that it actually isn't true. (laughs) Um, And, you know, regardless of how much money you have, you still are a human being who have, you know, serious existential questions that need to be addressed, you know, in terms of like meaning in life. What am I doing here? Um, And what's so interesting and one of the referrals I get, Paul, quite often is people who have come into large sums of money and, you know, the world believes now that you should no longer have any problems and you have nothing to complain about. And if you believe that, if you believe that money is going to be the answer to all of your problems, I mean, God forbid you get a bunch of money because all right. of a sudden it's like looking behind the, the curtain and seeing that there is no wizard. And if you have staked your entire life on this idea that reaching a certain socioeconomic level is going to erase all your problems and make yourself happy, it can be a devastating blow to realize, actually, no, that's not true. And certainly, it feels great. You know, So I, I'm not going to say that it doesn't feel great to come into a large sum of money or, or mm-hmm. to be really successful at business, but it's also short-lived. I mean, it, it's sort of like, think back to getting a present when you were a kid. It was the thing you always wanted. You got it, this new shiny toy. Well, th- the joy fades, and you're right back to kind of where you were in terms of like a happiness set point. So the money does not cure your problems. I mean, it'll solve some sh- short-term problems. And, and certain, let me just differentiate too. Like if you're living in poverty, money will help you solve a lot of your life's problems and it's going to make you happier. But all the research shows that up to a certain point, which is around the median income in the United States, you know, larger sums of money aren't going to add automatically to any sort of, sort of joy or happiness. You were quoted in the New York Times saying the difference between their angst, meaning billionaires or ultra high net worth individuals angst, and ours, just the regular normal people, 
is that a billionaire can't indulge in the fantasy that money would make everything better, where the rest of us can delude ourselves into thinking that if we just had this thing, it would fix our problems. Yep. And it's sort of like the unveiling of the fact that, you know, that belief is just built on sand and you can't really structure your life on that belief. But people do that, right? So you have people who are really engaged in work, you know, maybe even workaholics. They're just totally dedicated. They sacrifice relationships with their kids, relationships with a spouse or even having a relationship. Um, they sacrifice their health quite often. And one of, the, one of the key points that I work with people around, and it's, it's for myself too, you have to really enjoy the process of whatever you're doing mm. because once you reach a goal, that goal just sort of starts to fade away in terms of how important it is to you and how great it feels. In psychology, we call it the hedonic treadmill. Yes. It's like, you know, it, we can, you'll, you'll just look for another goal. This is sort of human nature. I think it's one of the things that helped us survive is never sort of being satisfied. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's really important to enjoy the process of whatever you're doing because the result, you know, the the accomplishment, the achievement, it'll be great and it'll just sort of fade away. Does the hedonic treadmill burn calories, Brad? (laughs) Well, it it definitely leads to frustration. (laughs) (laughs) If only it did, right? We'd all be in amazing shape. You say that billionaires have a distorted feedback loop because in many cases, they're surrounded by people who don't challenge their thinking. Do they have a harder time with trusts than people of more normal means? I do believe that they do, and for very good reason. The feedback loop is that, you know, I think it it happens with a lot of people who have high status. So, I mean, Mm -hmm. we can talk about that as being money or fame, um, where they tend to surround themselves or people want to you know, sort of feed into their ego or make them happy, basically. They want to be liked by them. And so they're they're less likely to get honest feedback from people, which is really damaging, frankly. You can really easily have a distorted version of yourself. All of us can if nobody gives you any feedback and no one tells you, hey, look, that's that's annoying, Paul, or that's a really stupid thing. You mm-hmm. just, you know, if everyone's like, wow, brilliant. Everything you say is brilliant. I mean, it's, it's going to distort your view of yourself and, frankly, your effectiveness in the world. And then secondly, you know, People are drawn to people who have higher status and certainly money. And so it can lead people to be somewhat paranoid around, you know, are, do you like me because of me? Are you just hanging out with me because of my money? And so I think that question pops up for a lot of people as they start to climb that socioeconomic ladder. And you've even been fired by clients because you were honest with them and they didn't want to hear what you had to say. Yeah, that's correct. And some of that is if you've been operating in a bubble where you're not getting any feedback for years and years, you know, it can be really uncomfortable when somebody, even if you pay them money to tell you the truth, (laughs) it can still be uncomfortable for sure. What kind of, and I don't, I'm not, I don't want to go into, obviously you have to be confidential about your clients, but what types of things do they not want to hear? What kind of truths are they shielded from that you deliver and then suffer the consequences for? Yeah, it's, it's actually fairly universal. A lot of it is relational. So people aren't necessarily aware of the impact they're having on other people. And I think the more you're surrounding yourself with people who want to please you and don't want to, you know, upset you because they're afraid that, for example, you'll fire them or you'll not want to be around them, the harder it is for people to just give you some of that honest feedback. And so a lot of it is actually most of it's interpersonal. So it's it's how they're impacting what they're doing, what they're saying is impacting the people they love, the people they employ and the people who um, service them, basically. How do you interact? Do you fly to their compounds and sit down with the whole family and help them communicate with their kids around money? Or what kind of services are you providing for them? So it, it's a combination. I mean, in, in the modern age, I'd say most of what I do is, is virtual. Mm-hmm. Um, but definitely we'll have family meetings. And I like to usually do it in, you know, like spend a couple days with somebody if I were going to make a trip. But a lot of times it's working with the people that, you know, they're working with or their family or their spouses Mm -hmm. or kids. You say that financial dependence, whether it is with multi-generational welfare families or multi-generational trust fund families, is debilitating. What do you mean by financial dependence? So financial dependence, as we describe it in our studies, is the reliance on income that you don't really do any work to produce. Mm. So it's money coming into your life. Not based on any any sort of concerted effort on your part. 
you know, things we would think of as work. Now, there's a little asterisk there because people work for that money in other ways. You know, on the welfare side, they have to, you know, comply with the rules. They have to get paperwork filled out, et cetera. On the multi-generational trust fund side, it's you have to comply with the conditions of the trust. You have to very often maintain a relationship um, that keeps you in, in good favor with the source of the money. But so money is a really powerful reinforcer. There are days, Paul, that I go to work where I don't necessarily feel like going to work, but I know that I'm going to get paid and that feels really good. And then I get Mm -hmm. to pay my bills. And so I get reinforced with that money. So that's how money works. It's a reinforcer, which makes behaviors more likely to happen. It increases behaviors. So if I get money for doing nothing, it just reinforces me doing nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, And sometimes we like to look at these people as having character flaws But I could take any person and create a financial dependent person who then does not want to work. It's sort of human nature to avoid pain and to seek pleasure, right? And so if I have the ability, you know, as a young person, for example, I'm 16, 17, the boss is mean to me, I'll just quit if I I don't need the money. You know, I don't need to sort of stick it out. And, And if I had to stick it out, I'd probably grow as a person. I'd learn how to deal with difficult people. I'd learn how to manage my own emotions, et cetera. There's all these learning things that happen when you have to stick through difficult times. Mm -hmm. Um, And we sort of rob people from that experience when we're financially enabling them, which is the flip side of the financial dependent. The problem with that financial dependence is it leads to people lacking a sense of drive, lacking a sense of creativity, a sense of purpose. This is what people report in our studies. And so it can be extremely debilitating in that sense where people don't feel like they really have much meaning in their life. You know, a lot of our meaning is derived by, you know, producing and being a productive member of society or helping, providing a service, that kind of thing. And, and we're, we're robbing people from that experience, which ends up being quite debilitating. Mm. I volunteer to be your subject in your quest to financially enable me. <laughs> Start sending checks my way. That experience of getting money and then sort of learning what you don't know you don't know. One of the reasons I started this podcast was because the the experience I had when I I made some money at Facebook and I just, I said, oh, I have enough money. I'm just going to not work. And shortly thereafter, I felt depressed and lonely and adrift with no identity whatsoever. Do you see that a lot with entrepreneurs and these kinds of families? People who sell their company and then all of a sudden have a lot of dough? Paul. That is the number one referral I get. <laughs> it's really? the number one person who, that I get who um, has had an experience exactly like yours. Yeah. So they've they've either um, exited a business or mm-hmm. they've sold a business or they've come into a large sum of money. My guess is you had a fabulous first three to six months, right? It was uh, awesome. Like, uh, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, that's sort of that's sort of the pattern, right? And of course, of course, all your listeners too. You you have a long list of things you would love to go do. Absolutely. And then what you don't really realize, though, is that effort you were putting in for you at Facebook was actually feeding a lot of psychological needs for you and emotional needs for you. And for a lot of men, too, frankly, mm-hmm. it, it fills, a, fills a social need for them that we're not necessarily great at filling outside of work. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a lot of women will put more effort into actually getting together with friends and talking and, and you know, communicating and, you know, doing that kind of thing. Whereas a lot of men will be a little bit more lazy in that sense. And so we'll get our sense of purpose and social needs met in this structured work activity thing. There's been a lot of research on what I'm about to describe to you, but we we have this fantasy that we're actually happier on the weekend and on vacations and our unstructured time, but all the research shows that that's absolutely not true. We're actually happier in our job, even if we don't like it much, where there's, there's structure, there's, you sort of immerse yourself in there. You sort of forget about yourself. They, they, it's a concept called flow mm. um, in, the, in the psychological literature where you sort of forget about yourself because you're involved in this activity that's somewhat challenging and it produces a, you know, something positive. There's a reward there. And when we eradicate that over a long period of time, it, it's just predictable that people are going to end up depressed, feeling lonely, feeling lost. Um, and some of the clients I, I work with, you know, have contemplated even suicide mm. because they're so depressed. And and again, part of that bubble being burst that, you know, the fantasy that this is going to solve all my problems. And then you get the outside pressure from people who are going, Paul, oh, my gosh, what do you have to complain about? Totally. You've got it made. Right. So it's really tough to find people that, you know, you can connect with and who, who will hear what's actually happening because people are running around with this fantasy that you have nothing to complain about. Yeah, and it's weird. I mean, it's it, it was completely unexpected experience, even though I'd read about it. And but I was like, but that's not going to happen to me. I mean, it's totally different. That guy doesn't. And, and I fortunately never got as so depressed that I contemplated 
suicide or anything like it. I just was like, I don't know what to do with myself. I may, should I go back to work? Well, I don't really want to do that. And so I've dedicated myself to comedy and writing and this podcast. But even today, knowing how hard I'm working without a paycheck, sometimes it doesn't feel like it's actually work. Like I deserve to take a vacation. We were on vacation last month and I felt like a worthless piece of crap sitting around on vacation when I don't have a job. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it, what an, what an interesting <laughs> experience you're having. Um, and, you know, you <laughs> and and I think, you know, I mean, to your credit, too, frankly, like you have found some passionate pursuits mm-hmm. for you to involve yourself in, which, you know, which we all need. I mean, this is a this is a fundamental human need yeah. is to be involved in some sort of work activities that um, it's, it's one of the criticisms I have or concerns I have with the fire movement mm-hmm. where there's all this focus on retire early, quit your job. And then what? Well, that's the question. And then what? My answer is, well, then you should probably go get another job, but not for the same reason. <laughs> you know. <laughs> then you should blog about it because that's what we need is more fire bloggers. So is this concept related to the concept of lottery winners and pro athletes going broke shortly after they make all that money? It is. I think it's what that is a that is a separate issue. What happens is that we have a basic, I, I call it a financial comfort zone. Mm-hmm. So you have a financial comfort zone. I have one. Very often it's what you were raised in. Now you can shift that as, you know, it's, it's, it's easier to go slowly. Let me put it that way. Mm-hmm. So you start out like poor and then you move up to the middle class and then you get in the upper middle class and then maybe high net worth over a period of 30, 40 years. What happens is you learn how to deal with an entirely new culture. You learn how to deal with an entirely different set of people, okay? And that's really, really important because these are very different cultures. Like if all of a sudden, if your listener lost all their money and were put into a, a totally different sort of culture of, of poverty, for example, if they haven't really been there, they're not going to know how to survive. They don't know how to, how to get resources and services and all of this. It's a totally new experience. Same thing happens if you go into, if you're like sort of thrust into a um, higher net worth arena. People have different service providers, for example. And so for one of the things that you run into is um, people who are middle class having a really, really difficult time hiring a CPA mm. or a financial advisor, which is, by the way, just sort of standard what high net worth people do because they need it. And it's, it's really difficult, though, because a lot of middle class people have this do it yourself mentality. And here's what I say, you know. I know you've got a pair of pliers in the garage, but you should outsource your dentistry. <laughs> right, you know? right, right. Um, and I feel like you know it, it's it's a hard hurdle for people to go over. Just as an example for that, you know, when when you're thrust into that higher net worth arena where you totally need that type of help and services, we have a lot of mistrust when you come from the middle class, et cetera. So what happens if you come into a, um, a, a huge amount of money suddenly? There's not enough time for you to learn the culture, learn the ropes. Like for, for me, like as my example, learn how to actually invest in, in, a, mm-hmm. in a reasonable way. And so people have a tendency to blow themselves up for several reasons. Number one, they don't really know what to do. Number two, we are wired to want to hang around in tribes. Mm. So this is something that's happened for us for thousands and thousands of years is that we are in a tribe. And so I, I just think about your tribe. And it, typically, there are people who have similar net worth, similar socioeconomic status, drive similar cars, wear similar things, eat in similar restaurants. I mean, we cluster around people who are like us in that regard. And if all of a sudden you're thrust out of that tribe, what it creates inside of you is a sense of psychological panic. And your animal and emotional brain say, oh, no, I'm going to die. Now, again, this is, this is all good, right? You just made a bunch of money. But all of a sudden... You're separated from the people that are close to you. You're separated from your tribe. It creates an inner sense of panic. Those people kind of turn on you a little bit because you don't really belong with them anymore. Mm-hmm. So they look at you a little differently. They may talk talk bad about you behind your back. You know, that kind of thing. So there's pressure there. So there's all this pressure to actually get rid of that money, go right back to where you are. Mm. So in my consulting, I, I tell people, you know, now it, it's not a black and white thing. Um, it doesn't have to be, but it kind of is. Like, you have two choices here. You're going to either have to get rid of all your money or you're going to have to get rid of all your friends. Mm. And in, and I say that, and there's always sort of a dramatic pause, like, what, all my friends? And I, I say, hopefully not. Um, but maybe there's a friend or two you can have honest conversations with around this. 
But just understand that there's going to be all sorts of awkward circumstances are, are going to start emerging. Let's say you now all of a sudden have 50 times more money than your best friend. So do you pay every time you go out to eat? Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe, right? I don't know. Do you want to go on vacation? Should you pay for it? Are you going to fly in first class and actually have them sit back and coach? You have a bigger house. They have a smaller house. Let's say you're feeling really stressed about a huge tax bill. Do you talk to your best friend about it? Is, are they going to be able to listen without judging you? So it, it creates a all sorts of tension spots for people. And for the average person who's not thinking about this, they end up getting rid of the money in some fashion so mm. they can get back to their comfort zone and their tribe. This is a good place, I think, to segue into the concept of money scripts because the way you react to those probably have to do with some guilt and shame and things you learned as kids. So you describe in your book, Mind Over Money, from Broadway Books, available on Amazon and find bookstores everywhere that haven't been shut down, the concept of financial flashpoints and money scripts. Can you walk us through what those mean? Sure. I'll use myself as an example. So when I went home and started interviewing my mother, trying to figure out why I was doing what I was doing around money, (laughs) one of the stories that I heard was that my grandfather... And I had no idea this happened. But one day when he was a young man, he went to the bank and the bank was closed. And and there was a long line of angry people and he lost all his money. Mm. So basically the banks collapsed, Great Depression era. All the money's gone. So what I didn't know is first of all, that happened. But what a flashpoint that was. What a traumatic experience that had to be for him. Like, oh my gosh, all my money's gone. What a terrible experience. Just imagine doing that tomorrow and all your money's gone. What that would would do to you. (laughs) It would suck. And it would lead to all sorts of hardship for your family. And, And so that's what happened to my grandfather. So... No big surprise that he had this belief you can't trust banks with your money. Mm -hmm. So this is an example of a money script. You can't trust banks with your money. 100% true. Like if he had had that belief before the the banks collapsed, that would have been a great belief to have. But he had it right after. And what I didn't know is that um, he died in his 90s and he never put a dollar in the bank the rest of his life. Mm. I mean, what a powerful, you know, experience that was. It led to this very strong belief he held. It was very rigid. So that sort of gave me some perspective with my mother around why she was so anxious around money, anxious about not having enough money, and very mistrustful of the stock market. She went a step further and put it into the bank um, and CDs, but would never put it in the stock market. Mm -hmm. Lots of fear and anxiety around money. So she had a belief you can't trust financial institutions with your money, can't trust the stock market. So I come along, and I'm going to do different things differently than my family. I don't want to be poor like my family is. So I call it a dysfunctional pendulum swing. So, you know, I got a family who won't invest anything. I'm investing all of it, you know. (laughs) So I swung all the way to the other side, not knowing what I was doing. And if I hadn't done that introspection, I'm sure I would have landed right back with my generational family belief of you can't trust, you know, rich people with your money. You can't trust banks. You can't trust financial institutions. Um, So the more emotionally intense those financial flashpoint experiences, the more difficult it is to sort of be open to new information and to shift your beliefs, Like my grandfather's belief about not trusting banks became totally dysfunctional when the federal government came in and started guaranteeing bank accounts. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's the interesting thing about these beliefs is they're they're always true in a certain context, but they can be highly dysfunctional in the sense of sabotaging your financial success. These flashpoints, some of which we experience in childhood, lead to money scripts. And you say that Trauma of a flashpoint creates neural pathways. Repetition means that the patterns are almost literally etched into our brains so that we're almost doomed to repeat the behavior we've seen or react to it in some way in the future. Yes, (laughs) that's actually right. (laughs) So I need to be Um, careful about what my kids are observing in my house. Yeah, you do. And, you know, a lot of our, what we know in psychology, too, is a lot of our personality and approach to life is, is pretty much defined by the age five or in terms of how we're experiencing the world. And so these are beliefs that are very profound and have a lasting impact on us. They're not erased just with being, having some awareness. And it, there are things that have to sort of be combated against. Like you need to be aware of these beliefs where the, and where they came from. Mm-hmm. And you need to be conscious of them because they're going to creep right back into your brain in moments of stress. What do I do with that, though? I mean, so, okay, I know I'm inclined to stress about money, and? So the question would be, what's the belief underlying that stress around money? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, what's clanking around in your subconscious? (laughs) God, I don't want to go there. 
<laughs> well, we, we could, um, but we don't have to. Um, but, you know, for some people, it's like, you know, there, there'll never be enough money. Yeah. So, so some people have this belief, this money script, there'll never be enough money. Very often it comes from growing up poor or even having a great, great grandparent growing up poor that you didn't even know about. I mean, this stuff can mm-hmm. really get passed down is that anxiety about not having enough. And so just being aware of that. So, for example, I have that belief, Paul. I have this belief that they'll, there's not, never going to be enough money because this is how I was raised. Mm-hmm. And so that belief will pop up into my head. I'll literally be having a discussion with my wife, and then I'll have this feeling come up and be like, oh, my gosh, there's not going to be enough money. And then when I follow that belief, and then what would happen? Well, then I'm going to lose my house, and then my kids are going to lose clothes, and we're all going to starve. I mean, this is literally where, right. where the snowball goes. And so I'm aware of that, though, and then I can stop it. I could be like, well, no, that's that's actually not going to happen. <laughs> I, I can engage my like rational brain to, ha- to talk back to that yeah. that instinct. And then, then you can lead to you know having some actually healthy behaviors. And in a relationship, my money scripts clash with my wife's money scripts, and so we have to come to a, an understanding of each other and, and try to practice empathy and understanding in the way that they manifest. That's totally true, and, and same thing's true for me, and it's true probably for most of your listeners too. Like The odds that you and your partner are exactly on the same page with all these beliefs around money is, is almost zero. And my wife grew up in a family where there was enough money. So she has this belief like, oh, things will work out. There'll, there'll be enough money. Mm-hmm. And, and, and then if, if we're not careful, I'll be like, what are you talking about? They're not going to work out. Um, so what couples will run into is not realizing that this is a script you're playing out from your family going back for generations and instead engage in all this energy to try to convince your spouse that your belief is the correct one and theirs is the, <laughs> the incorrect one, which leads to total you know disastrous conversations around money. It's one of the reasons that couples... You know, money's the number one reason for divorce in the early years of marriage. And a lot of it's because we're trying to convince our partner that these scripts we have around money are the actual true ones and theirs are all false. But aren't you supposed to be right as a husband or, or spouse? I mean, isn't being right the most important thing? It, well, I mean, you know, <laughs> you, you have two choices. You can be right, Paul, or you could be happy. But thank you, Dr. Phil. Thank you. <laughs> so what are the most common money scripts and how do we arrive at the most common ones? What we did is um, realizing that, you know, just by in, in anecdotal sort of conversations with clients, we realized that these scripts are, they're there, they seem to be impacting behavior. So what we did is over the course of about 10 years, we collected as many of these beliefs as we could from hundreds of clients. We put them into a big test. We'd, we've administered it to thousands and thousands of people. And then you run a bunch of fancy stats. And then what emerged were some common patterns. And so what we've found in our research is four main categories of money scripts these things predict things like your income, your net worth, a whole host of financial behaviors, whether you grow up rich or poor. So these things are really powerful and predictive. And so there are four categories we found. One is called money avoidance, which is basically the belief that money is bad or rich people are greedy or there's almost some virtue in not having money. So we have a tendency to want to avoid it. The second category is what we call money worship, which is the belief that more money, more stuff is going to solve all your problems and make you happy. The third category is called money status. And this is where we're really linking our self-worth with our net worth. Mm. And so you see this a lot with the keeping up with the Joneses kind of effect where I might tell people I make more than I actually do. I (laughs) I want to buy new flashy things. You know, it's really wrapped up in my status and my sense of self. The fourth category, and and thankfully there's a good one, is called money vigilance. And this is sort of a combination of having a little bit of anxiety around money. So you have some vigilance. It's like, I should probably save this. So these people believe that it's important to save money for the future. They they might even be a a nervous wreck if they don't have enough money. And then there's also a bit of secretiveness around this where they don't, they'll actually tell people, if somebody asked me, maybe I'd tell them I make less than I actually Mm. do. So they're actually the opposite of sort of bragging about it. They're much more secretive around it. So you have a tool, which we will put in the show notes, a link to your tool, which is an evaluator for individuals to go in and be able to rank themselves within these categories. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yep. So what I've done is I've put online the test that we've used in in research. So it's the same exact test, and it'll yield scores in these different categories and then help explain what those scores mean. Cool. Well, as you know, but our listeners don't, my producer and editor, Mike Carano, and I have both taken and received back our scores in these categories, and we thought we'd run through them for each of us, and maybe you can give us a little insights as to how and why we might be scoring on these, at these levels. Mike, do you want to rejoin us, please? 
Absolutely. There he is. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Carano from Studio City, California. Financial genius. <laughs> Financial genius. <laughs> I do, yes. And Brad, full disclosure, Mike's actually making a documentary that I'm helping him with, partially about his relationship with money. So this is a very topical topical thing for both of us. You see Mike's scores. So money avoidance. The range is one to four is or one to five on these, Brad? One, one to six. One to yeah. six. Okay. Or Mike, you want to? While I took the test, I just felt like I was pretty much in the middle. I didn't think I was extreme mm-hmm. on either side, but I also wasn't taking it with the thought that you were going to uh, <laughs> look at it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want, Mike, can you give a thumbnail of your financial situation in history? I, I'm uh, just horrific when it comes to finances. I don't want money, but then I need money. I'm very, very irresponsible with money. I, if I make $100,000 in a month, I will spend $101,000 in a month regardless. And it's, it runs in my family. And Paul knows this. When we started shooting this documentary, he came out here and just said, your life is chaos. Look at all this stuff because I'm just cluttered with... T- I have the entire set from the bridge of the Enterprise from Star Trek in my living room, like full size. And I've got t- literally hundreds and hundreds of box toys, just 18 or 19 camera bodies, probably 30 camera lenses, 15 guitars. I've just keeps... Anytime I ever got extra money, I will spend it immediately. I've also been overpaid and... Just, you know, and every year when taxes come around, you're not overpaid. As you may have intuited, Brad, Mike is single, first of all. <laughs> so let's go through the numbers. And we can talk a little bit more. So Mike's money avoidance score is Real 3. quick, 5. I take issue with that because every girl that's ever come over here has been, how do you get girls to come over here? And then, the, <laughs> then they go, and I go, eh, you're here. Every time. <laughs> all right, let's dive into the numbers. Money avoidance, 3.5. Yeah, so that is a, a an elevated score, and actually, Mike's pattern he's he's got elevations on all four of these. So, which to me says that there's a lot of internal conflict going on, um, and it's not uncommon for people to have you know it's not like you have one money personality type. So his score around money avoidance is pretty significant, which tells me that you know there's there's some conflict because he's got actually a pretty high money status score, which told me that he lives in California. Yes. <laughs> Where and anyway, that's that's my little California joke. I like it. Um, but <laughs> where everyone's leasing cars they can't afford, I mean, it's definitely. A oh, thing I live in my car, in by the way. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so the money avoidance there, there's that conflict around. You know, I, I don't necessarily want. Sometimes I probably don't want to deal with it. My guess is, Mike, that you might stick your head in the sand on occasion. You know, not necessarily wanting to review your statements. <laughs> um, did, is that correct? Uh, all think? the time. All the time. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm trying to be gentle, but but that's what that that's one of those that's one of the behaviors that that high score predicts is, you know, that I, is something I try not to think about it. And then your your higher score on money status is that I, I think you probably go through periods of time where you're feeling bad about yourself in terms of your status around you know how much money you have or um, and sometimes that leads to people overspending. Frankly, you know, getting that 16th guitar. Um, it's, that's not that uncommon, but then, but also you have a fairly high score on money vigilance too. So this is part of that internal conflict where, you know, one of the reasons you're making this documentary is probably because you realize that it it is an important issue and it's something that you actually have, you actually do believe it's important to save, even though you might not be saving as much as you'd like to, which leads to some of that internal conflict. I don't believe it's important. I'm just telling Paul that I believe it's important. (laughs) Okay. All right. So, so seriously, like you, you don't. Yeah. Okay. So tell me a little bit more about that, if you don't mind. So it's important to say for a rainy day, you don't necessarily believe that very strongly. I don't believe that. And I want to believe that, but I'm trying to not be my dad who is this ultra paranoid, doesn't trust the banks. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to, when you said the old school mentality, you know, of not trusting and being afraid of all this stuff, I just ring a bell in my head. But And I find myself doing that as well. I also don't think I, I deserve anything. I don't think I de- I think all of this stuff is a gift. I think I'm, it's all going to go away constantly. And then it's a, there's a whole lot happening with me around money because I've never, ever been responsible with money, ever. Every year when tax time rolls around, I owe and I don't have it. Even if I make one hundred and eight, hundred nine thousand dollars a year, which I'm not at all doing right now, but I've, it's happened in the past, and I just didn't have any money. And people are like, "Why don't you save any?" And I'm like, "I have no plans to save any." So one of the things you saw growing up is your father so focused on saving 
that it had a negative impact on his life and your life and, and perhaps even the family. I don't even know if it was saving. It was just we never discussed it. And he wouldn't take out a loan for anything. If he bought property, he had to pay cash. And then he clung to it like it was the only thing. And, and that's where we're at now with him as an older person. But, yeah, it, there it was never any, any discussion of it. It was just set in stone. You don't trust this person. You don't trust these people. The, everyone's a, Everything's a ripoff. And 100% do it yourself. When you said that, holy moly. He will not hire anybody to do anything. Yep. So my guess is, too, that, Mike, if, if you are approaching some of that, like the times that you are thinking about saving or moving forward, it probably triggers this like, oh, my gosh, you know, movement towards him in some way. Yes. You know, obviously not the way, yeah. you know, the way he did it, you know, I wouldn't recommend it. Right. Um, so th- there's a sort of a continuum on there. And anytime you take a step or two in the direction of that, you sort of have an emotion, probably an internal freak out, like, no way I'm not doing I'm not going to do it the way he did it. Yes. It could just be rebellious in nature or it could be logical. But the good news is I'm only 23, so I've got plenty of time to work this out. <laughs> you look great for 23. I appreciate it. Thanks. So, Brad, what what can uh, the grizzled look is in? What can Mike do? What are some practical steps he can take to strengthen some of these numbers? One of the most powerful things that I think helps is really link. And I was doing it in my conversation with Mike is linking these beliefs to where they came from. Mm. So putting them into perspective. Uh, because money is it's not something we normally think about as we're approaching our, our daily lives and decisions. And so putting those beliefs into context, like Mike's behaviors around money make total perfect sense mm-hmm. based on where he came from. And I don't know the whole story, but just on the parts he's told me, they make total perfect sense, like why he's doing what he's doing. This isn't some sort of mystery. This isn't some sort of like, oh my gosh, he's crazy or he's stupid or irresponsible. That's not what's happening here. It's very predictable based on where you came from. And I think it really, there's there, you get a lot of mileage out of identifying those beliefs, which you just did, and then linking them to where they came from. And then what you do is look at each one and, and, and ask yourself, is this helping me or hurting me? in terms of where I want to be financially. And when you identify ones that are hurting you, the idea is to make that belief more accurate. I'll just give an example, not that this applies to you, but the belief that rich people are greedy and money corrupts is is a very popular belief. And it is totally associated with financial failure. Like you're going to make less money. You're going to not have as much net worth if you have that belief. Now, I can find a bunch of examples of rich, greedy people doing terrible things in the world. Okay, that's not very hard. And that's the other difficult thing about these beliefs is I can find surround myself with friends who believe that I can look for every instance in the press. It's called a confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for all this information to confirm this belief we have. But it's also not the truth. Not all rich people are greedy. And so what you have to do is take that statement and make it more accurate. Like there are actually rich people who do incredibly wonderful things in the world, who've eradicated all, all sorts of diseases and who are really focused on making the world a better place. These people do exist. And so I encourage people who are money avoidant to try to strive to be one of those rich people who do great things in the world. And so now it's we're having this conversation, but what happens is that these things pop up on a very deep emotional level around our individual financial decisions. So that's why being able to be aware of where these come from and speaking back to them is so critical. All right. That was Mike. Now you see mine. I'm a little bit more skewed toward the conservative side. What should I be aware of pitfalls I might find myself falling into? So your scores were, you know, your highest elevation was around money vigilance. And all the studies show that it's a good idea to be vigilant Mm -hmm. (laughs) around money. And so that's good. You know, that that typically means that there's some, you know, I'd like to save you know, there's some conservativeness related to money. And that need to save and the desire to save is so important. Without that, you cannot grow your net worth, just period. Mm-hmm. Like money that just comes into your life and leaves your life does not help you in terms of net worth. Your other elevation was on money status. Mm-hmm. And that was higher elevation than your other two categories, the worship and the avoidance. So to some degree, and, and you talked about this when you're on vacation, you're feeling a sense of worthlessness because, and which is related to your own sense of status because you're not making enough money or you're not involved in some sort of productive effort to whatever this made up thing is, Paul, in your brain around <laughs> how much money that is or, or whatever. I mean, it's something you're doing to yourself. But those two are actually, in the studies we've done on the ultra high net worth people, those are the two categories that come out highest. 
So you have middle class and fairly successful people where money status isn't quite as big of a deal. But for those ultra high net worth people, they have part of their ego and self-esteem wrapped up in their business success. So actually, if you want to enter the higher realms of wealth, you know, some of that seems to coexist. Now, I will say this. A money status score that's significantly higher than the one you have is associated with totally terrible financial outcomes where people are leasing cars to try to show they have more money or buying Rolexes when they can't afford it. So you can have money status that blows you up. But it seems like a little bit of that is associated with people who are uh, more aggressively climbing the ladder or, or looking for that success. How do these scripts change over the course of your careers? You know, thinking about my own trajectory, you know, when I was 32, trying to prove myself, trying to make some money, wouldn't my scripts have been a little bit different than they are today later in life and searching for other kinds of affirmation from the world? In general, and so because we've done studies on this, in general, the younger you are, the more self-destructive beliefs you have around money. (laughs) And so, And everything else, probably. Right. And actually... To your point, too, I know you were kind of teasing Mike there a little bit, but if you're single, they're actually worse. Mm. So there's, And I think what happens is that when you have a partner, you have somebody going, hey, so what are, what are you doing? Mm. <laughs> Which makes you pause and say, yeah, what am I doing? Um, so it seems like having a partner who's intimately aware of how you're relating with money tends to be a healthy thing because it helps you become more aware. Right. Um, so yeah, a- as we age, as we get older, as we get more educated, these beliefs have a tendency to become healthier and more accurate. My wife keeps me in line. She's like, that shirt is too tight and we're spending too much money. That's right. Yeah. Hey, Brad, this has been a really fun conversation. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to join us and share your work and research with all our listeners. Where can people find you on the internets? At... Dr. Brad Klontz um, is Twitter and LinkedIn. And then, of course, my YouTube channel, which is Dr. Brad Klontz, where I post videos related to financial psychology. You know, Brad, we discussed talking more about the YouTube channel, so I apologize if there's anything you want to say about it. But really, a lot of the stuff that you have on there are bite-sized, very helpful clips of a lot of the things we talked about today. Yep, that's right. And I am trying to make it engaging and entertaining. My most recent one was on why zombies make great investors. (laughs) <laughs> Do you want to give us the thumbnail or should we make everybody click over there and go find out for themselves? I'm trying to find ways to describe behavioral finance in engaging ways. And so, you know, one of the things is zombies, they're not very emotional, right? So they mm. don't respond to, <laughs> to fluctuations in the market. And they also don't really care what other people think. So they're, they're sort of, they're not very hedonistic. They just sort of trot along. They're very focused. Mm. Um, so just as a metaphor for how, you know, to be a successful investor, you need to sort of emulate some of those zombie type behaviors. All right. Thanks again, Brad. We really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks for having me, Paul. Very enjoyable. Thank you very much, Dr. Brad Klontz. I really enjoyed our conversation, had a lot of fun with it, and look forward to speaking with you again in the near future. Folks, if you want to learn more about Brad, his YouTube channel link is in the show notes, as is the link to his money disorder assessment. Check it out. Brad Klontz, K-L-O-N-T-Z. If you like what we're doing here at the Crazy Money Podcast, sure would appreciate it if you'd leave us a few stars there in the review section of the app on which you are listening to it. By all means, write a review. Tell us what you like. Send me an email at paulollinger at gmail.com. Go to my website, paulollinger.com. Sign up. See my new show dates. Look at the link on the front page to my live comedy EP special, Alive on the Upper West Side, which you can find on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you find audio, digital content. Thank you very much to Mr. Michael Carano, editor, producer extraordinaire. Hope you all have a great day. Bye-bye.